And last, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Dybul, who's going to talk to us about esophageal trauma. I have uh, nothing to disclose, and I do have a disclaimer. I've never taken care of a patient that swallowed a sword and perforated their esophagus, but I bet Dr. Livingston has. So I'm going to talk about esophageal injuries. I'm going to talk about blunt and penetrating esophageal injuries, and also instrumental and spontaneous perforations. Uh, this, uh, I'm going to start off with just telling you that not everybody or anyone has a tremendous amount of experience taking care of these injuries. This was a paper that's off-quoted from uh, 2001. Dr. Juan Asensio was the f lead author. And it was from 34 centers, 10 and a half years, a total of 405 patients. So if you do the math, that's about 1.1 patient per year per trauma center. So no one has a large experience of taking care of these. Most of these were cervical injuries, which are the easiest ones to take care of. What about uh, non-traumatic perforations? This was a, a study from nine tertiary referral uh, hospitals in, in uh, Europe and uh, 194 patients with esophageal perforation treated over a 13-year period. If you do the math, that's about 1.6 patients per year per institute. I've developed a large experience because I've got gray hair and I've been working at the same place since 1989. I'm an old guy. So what are the tenets we're taking care of these? Management factors include the anatomic location of the perforation, the time of interval from perforation to initial initiation of treatment, whether the injury is contained or free, the severity of illness of the patient, the mechanism of the injury, and finally whether the esophagus is normal or diseased, if they have cancer or a stricture or something like that. This is an algorithm that was presented at the Western Trauma Meeting last year. These are very busy algorithm, but basically it puts everything in a nutshell for you, and I suggest uh, looking at this. The main thing is when you're talking about this, you need for accurate imaging in a stable patient with concern for penetrating esophageal injury. You'd be surprised. This is from a, anybody ever see Get Smart? Uh, there was a movie that came out with uh, Anne Hathaway and Stephen Carell. It's not as good as the original thing because uh, Don Adams was incredibly funny in this. He had, the, he had a shoe phone, you know, that, that was a big cool thing. Now we got these cell phones, but he had a shoe phone back in the day. So what do we do? The, the algorithms that were discussed before talked about doing uh, uh, barium and water-soluble contrast studies. And I think what most people have realized now that oral, uh, with oral contrast and CT, you can reliably uh, uh, identify esophageal perforation. The main thing is, is the oral contrast. There are some uh, 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 indirect findings you can see, but if you have oral contrast extravasation, that's 100% guarantee you've got a problem. What if you're doing uh, uh, contrast studies? You know, it used to be said in the algorithm, you do a water-soluble contrast study first. If it's negative, then do a barium study. That's a bunch of crap. I think if you do a water-soluble study, uh, that's sufficient if it's, if it's alone. It's uh, sensitive for the diagnosis of esophageal injury or leak with 100% sensitivity and negative predictive value. The only reason you'd use barium in this instance if they had an associated uh, airway injury because uh, gastrographin in the lungs is a bad thing. It, it brings all this water in and then you have an ARDS model on your hands. So this is a, a, a diagram. This is from a, a paper in uh, Clinical Imaging 2015. The main thing you need to know is is the contrast extravasation. If you see air around the esophagus, that may be the missile or the knife wound tract causing air in the in the tissue. So air alone is not 100%. The only thing that's 100% is the contrast extravasation. But if you don't see any air around the esophagus, and there's a gunshot wound, I think that's I think you can say that the, that's the bullet and. You, you can reliably exclude an esophageal injury in that instance. This is that same study I, I quoted, and what I want you to focus in on is in, the, in this 405 patients, time from emission to OR in survivors and non-survivors was seven, and a half, seven hours and five and a half hours respectively. That's because they're screwing around doing all these contrast studies in the radiology suite instead of just doing CAT scans and scopes.
This is a more recent study. This was in the Journal of Emergency Trauma and Shock in 2015. This is a query of the National Trauma Data Bank. And you can see here on the right, endoscopy was done uh, in two-thirds of the patients in, C in CT, 30%. Uh, barium swallow only 3%, other diagnostic studies 1.3%. You can see here that uh, the time to OR was two or three hours respectively. So you cut out that crap with sending patients for these contrast studies and you get to them in the OR faster. We're gonna talk about management of these injuries now. Principle of management, control of ongoing spillage from the esophagus, drainage of the pleural or metastinal cavities, broad spectrum antibiotics, and nutritional support. There are different ways of treating these. There's non-operative uh, possibilities, endoscopic possibilities, and surgical uh, possibilities. This is the uh, approach for the cervical injury. Uh, usually use a left-sided uh, incision along the sternocleidomastoid. Uh, if you have a bilateral uh, uh, bullet hole, then I would strongly advise doing a collar incision going up both sides. I had a patient that that's what I did. He was sitting at a, a party store and he was from Costa Rica. They asked him for his money. Of course, he doesn't speak English, and he wouldn't give them the answer or the money, so they shot him. And the only diagnostic test he needed was when he came to the resuscitation bag and, and the ER residents bagging the patient, I could see air blowing out of both sides of his neck, so I knew he had an air, airway <laughs> injury. So he had both a tracheal injury and an esophageal injury. I fixed both. Uh, some people say you shouldn't do a, a, a trach in that instance. But I did, and I fixed the holes in the esophagus. And what you need to do is take break down. And the reason I think a trach is important, I had no idea where his recurrent nerve was. So I think it's safer when you don't know is to go ahead and put a trach in. So he stuck around for a while. And this is his contrast study here. And I, I did a peg on him. It was a very novel way of doing a peg. He's got this two thirds of the, of the wall, the, the esophagus is gone. So I said, I said to the, the circulator, I said, go get me a scope. She what do you need a scope for? I said, don't ask questions, just get it. So through this hole in the, in the esophagus, I just put the scope in and did a peg on him, so I had my feeding tube, and I got reported for infection control because it was a non-sterile instrument, and there's spit all over the place. That makes no sense. <laughs> all right, here's another patient. Gunshot wound, there's the entrance wound, and uh, he's hypotensive and the bullet goes on the other side. Now what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I got smart. Don Adams again. So get smart. Eliminate chaos. Stay in control. Where don't you have control? If for me as a trauma surgeon, it's in the ED because everybody wants to do a procedure on the patient. I can't take it. I cannot take it. I demanded the cone of silence. You know what the cone of, <laughs> the cone of silence is? Taking the patient to the OR. That's what I did. So here, here is, we got a chest tube in. After you put the chest tube in, uh, anesthesia wanted to intubate him. I said, fine. And you can see the bullet goes across the other side and standing, sitting right next to one of the pulmonary arteries. You know, amazing, he, you know, it missed by that much. So while he's in the OR, I scope him. And I'm scoping him, and important to take the NG tube out when you're looking for a hole in the esophagus. You don't want any tubes in the way, right? So take the NG tube out. So I'm scoping him after the chest tube's in, and I, I smart, somehow I got smart at, at three in the morning. I, I said to the medical student, I said, look down at the pleurovac and see if it's bubbling. And I'm pulling the scope back up. He goes, God, it's bubbling like crazy, Dr. Diebel. And that's the first inclination I had a hole in the esophagus. And of course, I saw him after the medical student made me smart. So this is his uh, repair post-op. You can see the bullet sitting there. We put bilateral chest tubes in. Uh, he got, a, he got a, uh, a, a feeding tube as well, and he did well. Uh, there's some other options we'll talk about. Can, can you treat these conservatively? Answer is no. Surgical repair, resection, most of these can be fixed. Uh, could you stent these patients? I think there is a potential role for that as long as there's no other injuries. Not in, more frequently, the esophagus, is, there's other things living next to it, so not infrequently you have other things to fix besides the esophagus, so I think there's very few opportunities for stenting in that sense, and is there a role for esophageal diversion? One thing I like to do is I like to buttress my repairs. They talk about uh, a, 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 
intercostal muscle flap, I think that's the greatest thing. It's available. You've already done the thoracotomy. You've taken a rib out. It's just sitting there waiting to be done. Uh, I've been advised that you should not wrap the thing circumferentially around the esophagus and just sort of buttress the repair. If you wrap it circumferentially and the muscle dies because you screw up the intercostal bundle, then you've got a fibrosis thing around your esophagus and you have a different problem later on. I don't like using a, a pleural flap. A, a very famous surgeon described this, but that's more for a chronic condition where the, the pleura actually gets real inflamed and thick. The normal pleura is like sewing toilet, toilet tissue paper on the esophagus, so I would not advise it. And here's this post-op esophagram. You can see, can I do this? That right there is where our, our repair is done. You can see the contrast going through, and he did well. I, I last saw him in follow-up. I went to, we do have a Whole Foods in downtown Detroit now. But yay! And I, I go there on a Sunday after I made rounds, and I'm walking out to my car, and he goes, hey, Dr. Debo. And he's sitting in the car waiting for his mother. They're going to church after their trip to Whole, Whole Foods. It was pretty, pretty cool. So what about stenting these injuries? I think in 2015, there's very few instances where you should stent them prime up front. But if they have a, a leak from your thing, then I think that would be an ideal indication for stenting. Esophageal exclusion, I think there's very few instances where you should do this in the era of stenting, but it may be useful for delayed recognition of esophageal perforations. The, the principles are to divert the esophagus from above, to prevent gastric reflux from below, and to drain the area widely. Usually you, use a, you can use a T-tube, you put a chest tube in, obviously, and then a feeding tube. And this shows the T-tube repair going out here, and then some people advocate uh, uh, bring out a cervical esophagoscopy. What about abdominal esophageal perforations? Uh, I've taken care of one of these from trauma. I've taken uh, care of four or five from finger holes. You know, doing a vagotomy, we still do those in Detroit. Uh, and, you know, a re aggressive uh, resident, they don't feel the NG tube as well as I do. And next thing you know, you see this mucosa staring out. You know, so you just fix it and then wrap it. It's pretty easy to do. Okay, we're gonna talk about instrumental perforation, the same algorithm. You can do it non-operatively or operatively. It depends on if there's free perforation or, or contained perforation and the clinical status of the patient. This is a young man that was transferred to me from an ex uh, outside institution, uh, 17 years old, and this, the doctor said I perforated his esophagus um, dilating his stricture. And I thought, why would a 17-year-old have a stricture? Oh my God. So I got my surgery books out in my office and. I'm reading, you know, did he, was it a lie stricture? No, 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 he does, no lie stricture. Did he have a, a, a thing as a kid, a TE fistula or something? No, 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 no. He's mulled all this air in his neck. You can see on the CT and air around his esophagus. But he looks great. He looks great. So I'm thinking, well, maybe I should stop thinking and just put him on antibiotics and see what happens. So that's what happened. And four days later, we scope him, and the endoscopist says, well, he's got these linear ulcers, otherwise it looks pretty good. And I looked at him, I thought, are you senile? That, are you sure that isn't the trachea? That looks like the trachea to me. He goes, no, no, that's the esophagus, Debo. I, I know what I'm doing. So I, I was perplexed by this, and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, I've got to do manometry studies. And so I called GI and I showed him these pictures, and they told me, you're an idiot. This is classic eosinophilic esophagitis. And so we all became experts on that, very quickly, you suspect it in a young person with symptoms of dysphagia, food impaction, heartburn, or chest pain. You do an EGD and you do biopsies and you see 15 eosinophils per high power field. Typical findings include whitish plaques or exudates, fixed or transient uh, rings, either it's called tracheolization, and this is what a cat's esophagus looks like, so it's called felinization. Longitudinal furrows, diffuse narrowing, and friable or crepe paper mucosa. I think you could say that my patient had all of the above. And he did well. Okay, spontaneous perforation, same thing. Contain, non-contain, uh, uh, time of presentation, and uh, how they respond to the treatment. Uh, this is a man that was in jail. He vomited six times, and he came to the ED, and this was his chest x-ray. I think we all know that something's amiss in the left pleural space. So this is his CT. Looks pretty bad. So we fix this thing through the abdomen. You can fix it through the abdomen or the chest. The basic things are to fix it and wrap it. This is a so-called fall patch. When it was initially described, Dr. Allen Fall, who was one of our former chairmen, he was from the University of Minnesota, 
uh, and uh, he describes bringing a, a fundic patch up there and sewing it around the hole. I didn't read the original article, so I closed the hole primarily and then did the patch, and he did fine with that. And here's his contrast study. You can see that this is the, 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 the wrap around his esophagus, and, he, and here it is here. And he did well, uh, came back from, uh, from to see me in the office, and I think he actually got uh, released from prison uh, two or three months after that. What about stenting for this? Um, you can uh, stent these. There, there was, this was in uh, Journal of Trauma 2012. There's 14 cases, 40% required restenting. The problem with stenting at the GE junction, it tends to migrate down, and you may have to, may have to uh, re replace it. Uh, the newer stent models now have a way of fixing them so they don't migrate down, but that is a potential problem with stenting at that level. And th there was an a, a a article in Journal Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgeons in June, and uh, they talked about how great stenting is for this versus uh, surgical therapy. And this, uh, this editorial accompaniment is open surgery for iodogenic esophageal perforation now a surgical relic like bloodletting and trepanation. And the answer, I, I think, is, is clear that uh, there's still a role for surgery, particularly if they have a lot of contamination in the pleural space. This is a man that uh, came to the ER. Uh, he became a medical code. You can see there's something very bad going on in both pleural spaces. Uh, he was resuscitated. He goes to the CAT scan. You can see all this gob. Look at that gob around his esophagus. That's a horrific mess, a horrific mess. So we uh, put bilateral chest tubes, resuscitate him, got him a little bit better, and this is one that I put a stent in. You can see the, this is the normal lumen here. This is the big hole in the esophagus here. We obviously didn't have any history of uh, anything, but the, other than that, you can see this gumba coming out of there. That's the crud that goes into the pleural space. So we, we stented him, and here's, a, here's the stent being deployed here. We use uh, markers, we use something cheap, paper clips to sort of figure out where, what level we're going in. And this is the stent being deployed. You use this thing to take the stent out or replace it. And here's his follow-up study. Everything looks beautiful. And he did well and went home. There, uh, this was a review article from a meta-analysis of 75 studies talking about that. And there's 194 patients, nine centers, and surgery was associated with a slightly lower mortality rate versus stenting, however, stent grafting was associated with a better survivor with salvage esophagus, meaning they didn't have to take the esophagus out at a later time. There are complications with stenting early. You can have uh, stent migration. Obviously, we talked about that earlier and how you can, the newer models you can actually fix or you can actually put a tack there. Delayed complications are more common if, if you uh, leave these things for a long time. Current recommendations, if you have a, a uh, if you're stenting for a, uh, an astomotic leak, you should leave the stent in for a period of about two weeks and reassess. If it's for a perforation, spontaneous perforation or other, you should leave it in for a, a minimum of four weeks. There are some other alternatives besides stenting for these. They include various closure techniques, endoclips, suture, and this was, these are some of the clips that are available. These small clips on the left-hand side of the slide, these are pain in the urination, I think you just use one of these over-the-clip stents. If you can put a rubber band around on bleeding barracks, you can do this. It's the same exact maneuvers. And there, another technique that's kind of a novel idea is putting a, using a vac device, endoluminally, you, you put it, you put, you sew the, the vac uh, sponge on the end of a, not an NG tube with all the holes, but like an old-fashioned Levine tube. You, you go in the esophagus and you push it through the hole and then you put it up to a vac thing and there's, uh, uh, several authors, particularly in Europe, that advocate this for these perforations. I think it's a good idea because you help clean out the, the crud that's in the mediastinum through this. I think that the one thing I would say about stenting is don't forget that chest tubes may not be good enough for cleaning out the pleural space. And I think if you're stenting, like my patient uh, that I showed you, uh, he was sick for a long time, and I think it's because we, we just put chest tubes on both sides. We should have done a VATS on him and cleaned all that crud out, and I think we would have had a quicker recovery time. So in summary, management of esophageal perforation factors in treating, anatomic location of the perforation. One thing I should mention, you aren't going to stent a cervical esophageal injury. They're not, they're not going to tolerate that stent up there, so they have to be fixed or treated non-operatively. The time interval between the onset of perforation, initiation of treatment, the earlier you get these patients, the better they do. Whether the injury is 
is contained or free, contained per perforations, you've got time to think about it, think about non-operative management, free perforation, you either got a stent or repair. The severity of illness of the patient, obviously the, uh, the uh, spontaneous perforation or instrumental perforations tend to be older patients. Mechanism, uh, one thing I should mention, uh, I've taken care of two patients with blunt rupture of the es esophagus from trauma. One guy was crushed at one of those car wash devices and I operate on him and uh, I should have done a diversion on him. I sewed his esophagus, it was like sewing, sewing toilet tissue, I wrapped it. I could, you know, you can't, you can't shine you know what. So that was a mistake on my part and he had to have an esophagectomy 72 hours later. And again, whether the esophagus is normal or diseased. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you.